Well, we're going to do things just a tad different. I feel that it's right today to end with a, a time of praise and worship. So I'm going to share something with you. It's not going to take too long. Um, but as I said before, Sukkot is it's the culmination of these fall feasts. And what's so special about the fall feasts is in reality... The spring feasts are things we do in remembrance, like a memorial, but the fall feasts, we're not doing in a remembrance per se because they're prophetic in nature and they have not been fulfilled yet. So we do them more anticipatory. And, uh, you know, the fall feasts are just incredibly exciting. Not that the spring feasts aren't, they're all exciting, but these are incredibly exciting. We've had our trumpet blown and we have gathered, and as I told you, hopefully the trumpet sounded in your heart and my heart and it spoke to you according to what it's supposed to speak to. I'm not privileged to know that. I don't need to know that. And I don't want to know that. Uh, We have atoned. We have gotten together. We had 400 people here atoning and confessing. And it was legitimate. And now we've had our cleansing. And we are looking for an indwelling. Actually, soon, a dwelling. I mean, it says... Out of the body, present with the Lord. Uh, That's really good. But what's even better is in the body, present with the Lord. (laughs) And that's coming. There's, There's good, and there's better, and there's best. The good is having the Ruach HaKodesh, God's Holy Spirit, dwell in our tabernacle. Better is being in the Lord's presence. But better yet is when he comes back. And what the body has failed to see for so long, it is not the gospel. They stop it. It's the gospel of the kingdom of Yeshua HaMashiach. People will tell you all the time, no, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what happens with the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. That's it. That is not even the gospel. It is not the gospel. The good news is that the kingdom is coming. And for the love of God, how do we miss it When right in the Gospels, the disciples, the 12, the ones who had direct contact for three and a half years with Yeshua, and they say to him, we don't know how to pray. These are are devout Jews. We don't know how to pray. And he says, pray my kingdom come. Pray my will be done on earth. Hello. But what do we think about, really? We think about, "I I am saved by the blood of Messiah, which is true. And I, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That is not the prayer. That's not what he asked you to pray. He said, pray my kingdom come. So it's the gospel of the kingdom, and that's what Sukkot is all about. That's what Sukkot's fulfillment is all about. Um, you, you three, stooges, that's not going to work for me. Okay? So before you have a little party of your own, Let's, and, right? How many ears do we have? Two. How many mouths do we have? What do you think that tells you? Let's look at Leviticus 23 and try to figure this out. It says, Adonai said to Moshe, right there is very important, okay? It is the Lord speaking to who? The prophet, the priest, the go-between, the intercessor. In fact, in the Torah, it says a prophet would come, speaking of the Messiah, like unto who? Moses. Wow. Wow. It says that in Deuteronomy 18, 15, I think 18, 18. Twice it says a prophet's coming like Moses. So you've got to realize Moses has a pretty good rep. He was the only one that spoke to God, and God spoke to him. In fact, his rep was so incredible that his brother Aaron, who was three years older than him, and sister Miriam, who had a stellar reputation, they were prophets as well but when they gave Moses a hard time in Numbers 12 God came down and said you two come here and Moses was concerned because he had a beautiful heart he was concerned for his brother and sister and when he was off to the side he said listen to me is it not good enough that you're a prophet and a prophetess is it not good enough that I speak directly to you in dreams and visions And of course, you know, God's speaking directly to them, and, you know, they're shivering. And of course, the answer is rhetorically yes, 
it's good enough. And then he says, but before I go, let me make one thing perfectly clear. Your brother, we speak face to face. I don't speak to him in visions and in dreams. So he's at a different level than you. And make no mistake, there are different levels of believers. I know some people think that we're all in the same playing field. Absolutely not. When the disciples said, who would be the greatest in the kingdom? If we're all on the same level, Yeshua should have answered, there is no greatest or least in the kingdom. But he said, you who are the most humble will be the greatest. And he also said in Matthew 5 that there are least and greatest in the kingdom. So these are, I'm, just, I'm just quoting him. And some people want to be great, not for fame. They want to be close to God. And then some people are just satisfied. And that's the way it is. So Adonai is speaking directly to the servant of the Lord. That was his title. Tell the people of Israel. Now, I have a lot of Jewish friends, and my whole family is Jewish, and most of them are not celebrating Sukkot. Tell the people of Israel. Obviously, there was a mixed multitude at this point, right? It says, I think, in Exodus 12, 38, that a mixed multitude left, which means Hebrews and non-Hebrews. They left. In order for non-Hebrews to leave Egypt, they had to put the blood on the door, and they became part of this commonwealth. It is no different today, even though we've been taught differently. 2,000 years ago, it was strictly a Jewish faith, Messianic Judaism, Jews who believed in Messiah. Then all of a sudden, non-Jews were coming in. Peter was freaking out because Yeshua said, don't go to the lost sheep. Don't go to the lost sheep of house of Israel. Don't go the way of the Gentiles. So he's saying, what's going on? He has his deal in Acts 10 with Cornelius, and, and, and the vision has nothing to do with eating. That's ridiculous. Can you imagine this, this genius, this, this incredible disciple, this wonderful, powerful man of God is, is walking around with his vision of the sheet, and he can't figure it out for three days, and the best we come up with in the evangelical community is, now you can go to Paul's pulled pork palace. It had nothing to do with food. It was metaphor. It was saying that these unclean Gentiles, that they believed were unclean, that Yeshua said were unclean, didn't he say to the woman, the Canaanite, you're like a dirty dog. I can't give the food of my, my people to you. That's what they were considered because they were idol worshipers. Incredibly heathen. But he said, don't call unclean what I call clean. I'm bringing them in. And Ephesians says, now the two will be one. The wall, there was a court of Gentiles. That wall has come down, figuratively speaking, metaphorically. And now you, and I don't care if it's 2,000 years later, I don't care if you title yourself a Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, or anything else you want to throw on yourself, which, by the way, was not in God's plan. But if you want to call yourself that, understand, according to the New Testament, you are grafted in and you are part of the commonwealth of Israel. That's what the New Testament says. So these feasts, if they're Israel and you're part of that commonwealth, I would think you would celebrate them. Just like I think it's really bad when people come over here and immigrate, like my family came over in the early 1900s through Ellis Island. It would be a terrible thing for them to come, receive from the United States all the compassion and benefit, and yet not abide by their laws and rules and their constitution. That's like a slap in the face. That's the problem we have today. But that's the problem we have in the spiritual realm. It's like, I'll take all the promises. No weapon formed against me. I'll, I'll take the patriarchs. I'll take the covenants. I'll take the promises. I'll even take the Messiah, salvations of the Jews. But as far as your feasts, I nah, don't want them. Why? They're God's feasts. They're not the Jewish feasts. There were no Jews in Leviticus 23. They didn't get in the promised land. They weren't in Judea yet. They were Hebrews. They were sect of slaves. They're not Jewish feasts. Nobody's asking you to do Jewish stuff. We're asking you to do God stuff. Yes. Tell the people of Israel, that's you, on the 15th day of the seventh month, that's today, is the Feast of Sukkot, Tabernacles in English, for seven days. So today's the first day it's going to go on for seven days. That's why we're camping. On the first day, there is to be a holy convocation. That's what we're doing here. We're convocating. Holy because the Holy One has imputed His righteousness to us. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. Rabbi, I, I, I got to work. I'll get fired. Look, if you get fired, I understand. I told you that. I sent you an email. But you, you could take off. Come on. Don't tell me you can't. Tell me you don't want to. For seven days, you want to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. Sacrifice. 
to show him that you are thankful. On the eighth day, which will be a week from today, you ought to have a holy convocation. So what are we going to do on the eighth day? Yeah, we don't, you don't have to be a theologian. This is very basic. You know, Yeshua never spoke in more than three syllables. I don't understand. You know what? He wouldn't even understand some of the men of God today. You've got to make it so that uh, if my kids understand it, then you'll understand it. Right? That's what I figure. So we're going to have another holy convocation, yes? On the eighth day, and we'll bring an offering. Some of you might be upset about an offering. Then tell God you're upset with it. Some of you might be upset with tithing. Tell God. You'll give Uncle Sam 25%, but you won't give Father God 10. I don't understand that. Well, what are they doing with the money? What do you care? I never cared. I was giving it to God. Who are you giving it to? If you're giving it to us, keep it. We don't need your money. Uh-uh. Some of you got here a few weeks ago. It's a $3 million building. It's paid for. What offering did you make to the building? But you're enjoying it. You're not giving the money to us. You're not giving the money to elders. You're not giving the money to me and my family. We're on a salary. That doesn't change. The offering is to God. Bring an offering to Adonai. That's what it says. It is a day of public assembly. Some people say, well, I'll, I'll do it in my house. Wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. Well, I don't want to get together with people anymore. Don't forsake the gathering in Hebrews. You're wrong. I mean, just admit, I understand you've been hurt. So have I. You want to compare notes? I'm still here. What I'm saying is, but it's wrong. I mean, I understand, but you have to, we only have, this is the manual. This is all you got. You can't get no secret revelation. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. So here we are. Now, it says to live in a sukkah. A sukkah. So you could have called in, you could, you, sometimes you call in sick when you're not sick, right? I wouldn't want you to do that because that's lying. But you could have called in sick coat today. <laughs> Look, it's, it's not easy being funny and being clean. You try it, okay? <laughs> I know, I know. You know what I'm talking about. Let's look up the word sukkah so we know what we're talking about. It's a booth, real simple. A booth or temporary shelter. So what do you think God might be telling us? Why do we really need to be in a sukkah? That's silly, right? But you know God always has us do things in the physical to explain something spiritually. Yes? You know this, right? Always. So what, what is he telling us why we should live in a temporary shelter? Temporary, don't get you settled. Oh, I know, call me. <laughs> well, I think I know. It, suc- Sukkot's a, a corrective. It, it's to correct us. Because so many of us are so attached to surf, turf, and stuff. When God says put down ten pegs, he means ten pegs, not cinder block. You know, you, you've heard this a million times, and I'll tell you a million ones, because I'm just telling you, we would have lived on the beach the rest of our life. Glenn Beck, who I don't agree with Mormon theology at all, and Mormon theology is not my Bible at all, okay? I think he's a wonderful guy, but I totally disagree with his theology. You understand? Okay. With that being said, because I don't want any emails, ask me if I believe in Mormonism. No, I don't. With that being said, he was a very unpopular guy when he was young. He had nothing, and he finally reached the pinnacle of his career. He had one of the nicest apartments. They used his apartments in major movies in New York City. 46th floor, skyline. You're talking about an apartment like this would be 20 grand a month to rent, maybe more. And when they asked him to stop talking so much about God, he walked away. Is he a great guy? No. No. See, this is the problem. The bar is so low that he looks so high. Listen to me, guys. We need to correct ourselves and stop calling what's nominal phenomenal. Listen to me. I'm not looking to hurt you. I'm I'm in the party mode, but I'm talking to you what God talks to me. Okay? And that's all I can do. 
All I can do is talk to you what he's talked to me. I'm not just teaching scripture. Mm -mm. We have set the bar so low that any little thing we do is. How high is the bar set? What did God give up when he stepped into his creation? Now, I understand that's a hard act to follow. But follow it, we must. Right? What did he always say when he called people? Follow me. What does that mean? Do what I do. What does it mean to be a Christian? Doesn't it mean to be Christ-like? Wouldn't that be the definition? Well, then I think. Do you hear what I'm saying? Drop your nets. What do we do? Uh-uh, I ain't dropping this net. Mm-mm. Nope. I'm, I'm just about to... We would have lived there for the, we, this is all, all, that was our little dream. Little Bernadette when she was young and lived in with her six brothers and sisters in the dinky little apartment in the Bronx. And they had nothing, not even an air conditioning, us in a little project. My dream was like, oh, one day, maybe one day if I become rich, I can live by the beach and hear the water. And that day finally came and God went, Phew. But he didn't yank. He, do you see when he asked Abraham to drop everything? Do you see anywhere where he got him in headlock and said, come with me? No. Even Yeshua said, I don't want to do this. I mean, do you read what I read? Did he not say that? Do you think that was an act? Hemodrosis, he's sweating blood because he's so anxious. Do you think that was an act? But what does he say ultimately? And when Yeshua said, follow me, let me tell you what he was saying. Let me give you the GHV, the Greg Hirschberg version, not too popular. <laughs> what he was saying is, hey, Tony, you want to come and die? You want to die? See, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I was thinking about the campground for a minute. I got carried away. Anyway, look, nobody's, nobody's saying, God, how many times does God say give up everything? He doesn't do that to us because that's really hardcore. All I'm saying is just don't have your sin. Don't, well, I've lived here for 20 years. I'm going to live. This is my place. I love Georgia. It's like, come on. Are you kidding me? Just lighten up. Loosen up those ten pegs, man. And those purse strings. We got to be detached to as much as we can. Maybe anything and everything. But as much as we can, except God. In other words, we got to hold on loosely, but don't let go. If you squeeze too tightly, no, 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 no. That's a 38 special song. I could care less about that. What I'm saying is hold on loosely to the world. Hold on loosely to your stuff. But hold on with everything you got to God. God doesn't want you to necessarily live in a cave. That's not, that's not, uh, you're not in violation of, of a, a tight walk with God because you have a beautiful car and a beautiful home and nice clothes. Poverty is a curse. That's not the issue. It's the love of those things that's the issue. The problem is, can you be happy with a lot, and can you be happy with nothing? That's really the question. God's not saying you have to have nothing. I'm not saying you have to have nothing. I see men and women of God that are incredibly blessed, and it's the blessing is from God. It's legitimately from God. We know, Bernadette and I, what it is to have nothing, a lot, nothing, a lot, nothing, some. God's saying, hey, Greg, can you, where are you getting your happiness from? The surf and the turf and the stuff? Or me? It's a corrective. That's what. And what I love about this word, sukkah, is it has a word. In, in Hebrew, you've, you've got to sometimes get to the root. That's really what, what gives you a nice descriptive. You know I always do that. There is a root to this, and it's sochach. And the root means, drum roll please, we've got to change the slide. Good. To hedge. To fence about, to join together. Look at how beautiful that is. Why is God asking us to live in, in these temporary shelters? 
because he doesn't want us to have the security system and the walls and everything. You know, some of us have it all figured out, right? Nobody's going to get into my fortress. God says, let me protect you. God wants us to be the damsel in distress. He does. He, he wants to be our knight in shining armor. That's why Yeshua is coming back. He's coming back as a knight in shining armor. But what do we do? Especially some guys I know. They act so tough. They feel like they have to. First of all, let me tell you what your wife... One day I'll teach a course on this. I really feel I need to. What your wife really needs is a lot of tenderness, a tremendous amount of love and sensitivity, uh, listening, and um, a lot of kindness. You think, no, she, she feels protected by me. Listen, first of all, you're not there all the time. So who's protecting her anyway? You're not there when she goes to the store. God is protecting her. Of course you're going to protect her and your family. You're supposed to. I get that. But how can you be so vulnerable to God unless you're vulnerable a little bit? So God's saying, I want to fence about you. I want to tabernacle i want you to join with me and me with you when he gives us his fences which to me is his word his torah the torah is a fence it's a fence he's not keeping the sheep from going outside to have a good time he's keeping the wolves from coming in to attack the sheep shepherds had a sheepfold back in the day back in the days of yeshua there was only one entryway into that sheepfold and a good shepherd slept in the doorway at night. He wasn't like, don't, don't you go out there, you stay in here. He was trying to avoid the sheep from getting hurt. That's what God's word is all about. It's all about bringing peace, protection, and prosperity to his children. Leviticus 23.41, which is part of this section of Leviticus that speaks about Sukkot. You ought to observe it as a feast to Adonai seven days in the year. It is a permanent, which I always go over this, all of them are. Permanent, just in case you would like to know what permanent means in your scriptures in the Hebrew language. The word is olam, like Adon olam, the master of the universe, the permanent universe. It means eternally. I'm sure you know what that means. Or, if you don't like that, how about indefinitely? Or, always and for, it's Always, not like you don't skip a year, and forever. In fact, it tells us in Zechariah 14, which you know Zechariah is a prophet, a legitimate prophet. He says in the millennium we will celebrate Sukkot. In fact, those who don't celebrate Sukkot won't get rain. No rain, no food. No food, you die. So it's, it's, it's like it's even the people that don't want to do it are going to be forced to. Now, why in the world would we celebrate Sukkot in the Old Testament? Why would we celebrate it in the New Testament? Why did Yeshua celebrate it? Then, for some reason, it disappears. <laughs> and then it comes back when he comes back. <laughs> Forever. I'm being sarcastic because I'm a New York Jew. But... I'm being sarcastic because I think it necessitates sarcasm because it is so spiritually illogical. Leviticus 23, 43 says this, and this is the last part of Leviticus that we'll go over. You are to live in Sukkot, temporary dwelling places, for seven days. Every citizen of Israel, if you are born again, you are not a citizen of Macon, Wittenberg, Rome. You are a citizen of Israel. So says Ephesians 2. That's what that whole letter is all about. The whole letter. Colossians is all about the head of the body. Ephesians is all about the body of the head. And he says that body cannot be dysfunctional. If it's separated, there's no unity. It's got to be together. Jew and Gentile, one and Messiah. We can't have two different sets of feasts. Then we have two different gods. And it says in John 10.30 that Yeshua and the Father are one. If they're one, how can they have different rules? You know what happens when two parents aren't one, right? Kids become dysfunctional and they play you. Okay, so it says live in a sukkah, and you might say, why? And so I stopped at this portion of verse 43 because I don't blame you. 
so that generation after generation of you will know so that your kids and your kids' kids and now my kids, what do they need to know? What do my children need to know? They need to know this. Leviticus 26, 11 through 12. This is the section of Leviticus where after God gives all his laws, he says, if you follow them, these are the blessings. If you don't follow them, these are the curses, not the consequences. I know we soften things up today, but that's not, it's inappropriate. It's adding or taking away from the scripture, and that's very dangerous. He says that if you abide in me, if you obey me, I will put my tabernacle among you. This is astounding. I mean, was not the tabernacle among them? Was not the Holy of Holies? Was there not a glory cloud over it? Why? There was a peace of God in there. And then what does John say? He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, meaning Yeshua wasn't a person until he manifest his presence on earth. He was the Word. God spoke, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It was part of God, part of the Father. And he said, and then it took on the Word, God's word spoke into Miriam's womb, and it took on flesh, and it tabernacled, succoded among us. This is just a further manifestation of the promise in Leviticus 26. Isn't it nice when things tie together? I will walk among you. Wow. That's crazy. That's crazy. But we know there's even a greater manifestation to come, because Yeshua is going to come back. Not on a donkey. I mean, not with a crown of thorns. That's kind of hard to look at. You know, he's coming back on a steed as the king. And after he rules for a thousand years and we get to graduate, we get to graduate because he still has to teach us. And a lot of you are going to be very surprised. I can't wait till you look at your shoes and say, why are you doing all this Jew stuff? Maybe because he is the king of the Jew stuff. And after that millennial reign, guess what? He passes it off to the father, and the father comes and dwells, and we get to see his face. Now, I'm going to go over this very quickly, and I'm going to try to make a point. Hopefully you don't have anywhere to go. If you do have to go, I know some of you can only get a small window at work because it would cost you a job, and I don't want that. So if you have to leave, please leave with any, without any condemnation. Please. You know how I feel. I'm here, whether it is one person or a thousand people. Please, you're not going to upset me if you get up, and what you're not going to throw me for a loop. Whatever you have to do, do. But it says in Luke 3.1, in the 15th year of Emperor Tiberius' rule, When Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judah, Herod the ruler of the Galilee, his brother Philip ruler of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was the ruler of Abilene. Do you think God, the Gospels are so small. Remember I tell you three is synoptic, which is Greek for seen through the same eyes. Yeshua doesn't teach much at all. Do you think God's going to waste holy space? Why in the world would he put so much historical information in the telling of his son's birth? My take on it is that obviously it's important for you to know when it was. Now follow me. It's, it, you might get a little lost here, but I'm going to give you something to study. Grab the CD if you want. It says in 23, at this time, Luke 3, 1, I'm just, I had to take out a little bit because... Otherwise, we'd have to read 23 verses. At the same time, when these guys were ruling, Yeshua was about 30. Now listen to me. I'm going to be 50. How old am I going to be? 54. Thank you. Wow, I can't believe I forgot how old I am. I'm going to be 54 in January. I would not tell you today, October 1st, I'm almost 54. That's ridiculous. It's it's October, November, December, and January 6th. So over three months away. You don't tell somebody you're almost 54 when it's three months away, okay? Maybe when it's a couple of weeks away, you say, I'm almost 54. It says he was about, if you look up that word in the Greek, it was very close to being 30. Yeshua began his ministry in the fall because we know from historical records, 
Greek historical records that 3.1, Luke 3.1, was the fall of 29. Now, we also know this. Listen to me now. That's why any theologian, some of you look confused. Help me out if you're confused. Are you confused? Tell me. It's okay. I'll explain it to you. You're, you're all right? You're confused. This, this, in the 15th day of Emperor Tiberius' rule, Pontius Pilate was good. At that time, we have historical books that tell us that took place in the fall of 29. If Yeshua was almost 30 in the fall of 29, how could he be born December 25th? It's impossible. What's even more impossible, I'm not going to get into it, is if you go into Luke 1 and 2, it says that Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, well, he's not a Baptist, but Yochanan the Immerser, it says that his father Zechariah was of the Avijah division of priests. Now why is that important? Because 1 Chronicles 24 breaks down the divisions. His division served... In the eighth term, they served for a week at a time in the, during the season of the spring and the season of the fall. The year starts in Nisan. So we know from that narrative, it says, at the end of his serving, in the, his wife Elizabeth got pregnant. Then the Bible goes out of its way to tell us that Yeshua was six months behind the conception. Why do they give such detail? Most of us could care less about the detail. God wants you to care. I want you to care. Because if we know the exact conception, which we do, of Yochanan the Immersa, and we have no reason to doubt that it was a 40-week pregnancy, because it doesn't say that it wasn't. There was no miscarriage. There was no incubation. You get born two months earlier back then. And it says Miriam got pregnant at the six months. We know six months behind. Then we know... That Yeshua was conceived in Kislev around November, December, which means 40 weeks would bring him to Sukkot. If he dies on Passover, Pesach, if he's buried on unleavened bread, if he rises on first fruits, if he sends the law to be written on a heart on Shavuot, what do you think the shot is of the God who tabernacles with us might just be born on tabernacles? In fact, I'm here to tell you that th Tabernacles is all about thanksgiving. They're thanking God for his presence in the wilderness. They're thanking God that he sent the son. We're thanking prophetically when he comes back. It's all about thanksgiving wasn't the third Thursday or whatever it is in, in November. That's baloney. We did that. Our presidents did that. The Puritans, they were celebrating Sukkot. Why do you think the dish they have there that nobody could explain is called Sukkotesh? There's no derivation for it. They say it's a mix of corn. And no, it's not. This isn't the cooking channel. They were celebrating Sukkot. They were being thankful. Now, let me show you how remarkable this is, because there's not a theologian in the universe that won't tell you that Yeshua's ministry was three and a half years. Okay? If he dies in the spring, do a calculation for me. Three and a half years from the spring, how do you get December? Let's look at something else logical. A.T. Robinson, who is the quintessential Baptist theologian, in his book, Harmony of the Gospels, page 267, says, of course Yeshua was born during the fall. Well, A.T., then why the heck are you celebrating December 25th? When's your birthday, lady? February what? Well, we're going to celebrate it June 26th. Tough. <laughs> Is this an issue? It's a big issue. We don't want to make it a big issue because we don't want to change our ways of doing things. It's a big issue, and that's why God put all this in there. It's a big issue, pal. You might not think it is, but you're not God. Okay? You want to obey God? You want to man up? Then obey God. And stop being a slacker. Now, now, now look here. His ministry begins in the fall, right? Matthew 12, 38, 40 says this. At this, some of the Torah teachers, he's at this. What's happening right here, I can tell you. The first, like, 24 chapters before 38, he is lacing into the religious community. And I mean, whew, he is ripping them up. 
I mean, lace it in. Okay, we think Yeshua was this docile little Shakespearean actor. Listen, there was times he sat at the table and ate. There's times he turned it over. You just got to know what time it is. At this, some of the Torah teachers said, Rabbi, we want, listen, if we turn the tables over, prayer went to left the school. We're too docile. We're too sterile. We think, well, we will be unloving. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to hate the world. Eh. At this, some of the Torah teachers said, Rabbi, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. He replied, a wicked and adulterous generation. Because they were saying he's, he's casting demons out by the power of Beelzebub, by Satan. He's saying Satan can't be divided against himself. A house divided would fall. A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign. No! None will be given to it but the sign of the prophet Yonah, Jonah. For just as Yonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the depth of the earth. Now people have played with this and played with this, and they have just dug a hole deeper than they need to dig. Okay? If the resurrection was the first day, which it was, make no mistake, Sunday, days start in Jewish reckoning at sundown. So if it's early in the morning, early in the morning for us is what, like maybe five, six? But our day starts at midnight in the Gregorian calendar. If their day starts at sundown, early in the morning would be like one, two o'clock. Okay? So he rose maybe one, two o'clock, somewhere in there, I'd, I'd take it. But the fact is, it was still the first day. After sundown Saturday night, tonight will start the third day of the week. You follow? The Bible just calls it first day, second day, third. It's not Sunday, Monday. By the way, those come from the sun god and the moon god. Moon day, Sunday. No big deal. I know you don't mean nothing by it, but I just want you to know where things come from. The Bible calls it first, second. The only day it separates is Shabbat, seventh day. For just as Jonah was in the so, you have here three days, three nights. If the resurrection is the first day, he had to be crucified on Thursday. I know people say Wednesday or Friday or whatever. It's Thursday. Three days and three nights. Do the math. It's real easy. Three and three is three and three. Now, don't get crazy. So, Passover, the year he died, had to be on Friday. You follow? Had to be, because it was preparation. They're preparing for the Passover. They want to get him off the cross before Passover. How are they going to celebrate Passover with people on the cross? Got to get him off the execution stake, okay? Now, Sir Robert Anderson, anybody know him? You're kidding. You do? Well, I'm raising my hand, not, not because I won't have a question. I want, does anybody know him? Please raise your hand. Okay, he was Scotland Yard's chief inspector, wrote the book called The Coming Prince. You got to read it. He used Rosetta Stone calendars. It, it, his work has been, you know, highly acclaimed by every theologian in the universe. Okay, let me just give you a list here, all right? The Coming Prince, page 104, A.D. 30, 31. Now, he's born the fall 29, A.D. 30, 31. This is when Passover falls out. I told you Passover has to be on a Friday. So, because his ministry was three and a half years, he had to die either... 33 or 36, okay? So far, so good. I know there's a lot being thrown at you, but just, he had to die. He had to be crucified 33, 36. We could figure it out using Daniel. Real simple. Look at what Daniel says. I knew this was going to f- knock you out, but I'm sorry. I forget that I, okay. You, you can, it doesn't. So you're good. Good. And if you're not good, for four bucks, you could buy the CD, okay? You can't get a chicken sandwich for four bucks. Seventy weeks have been declared. Now, in Hebrew reckoning, that 70 is weeks of years. So 70 times 7 is 490 years. He's speaking about there's a period of 490 years, Daniel's telling us. Okay? 490 years have been decreed for your people. Okay, that's Israel. And for your holy city, Jerusalem. Putting an end to the transgression, no more sin. For making an end of sin, he explains it. For forgiving iniquity, okay? Total forgiveness for bringing in everlasting justice, talking about the kingdom coming, for setting the seal on vision and profit, meaning no more prophecy, all is fulfilled, okay? Follow so far? We're okay? And for anointing the especially holy place, that's the holy of holies, so there'll be another temple, and it'll be anointed because the anointed one will be sitting on the throne. We're okay? I'm sorry, I got to move on. Know therefore and discern that seven weeks of years, so we're talking about a 49-year period, will elapse between the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed prince comes. So the rebuild Jerusalem is the Cyrus decree that you find in Ezra. So they were 49 years when they started to rebuild Jerusalem, which has come to pass. Okay? Not talking about building the walls. That's Nehemiah. 
talking about building up Jerusalem, okay? So far, so good, the Cyrus Decree. So we see 49 years. Okay, and rebuild Jerusalem. It will remain built for 62 weeks. So, so far we have 7, and 62 is what? 69. 7 and 62 is 69. This, uh, if Annie had three apples, <laughs> and she added another apple, how many apples does Annie have? It's 62 and 7. It's 69, no matter what math you use. With open space and moats, but these will be troubled times. Troubled times. Then after the 62 weeks, Mashiach will be cut off. So he's saying, he's, he's prophesying a time when Messiah will die. This is the incredible part. The people of a prince yet to come will destroy the city. In 70, the people of the prince, the Roman prince Titus came in and flattened it. And the sanctuary, he destroyed the temple. But his end will come with a flood and desolation to the creed until the war is over. The time of the tribulation. Now, let me show you something, okay, from this Daniel, okay? 69 weeks of years, you saw that number, okay? Times seven days in a week. Times 360 days in a year, that's Jewish reckoning. On the lunar calendar, which is the, there's 30 days in a month, 12 months. You have 360 days. So, he's talking about 173,830 days are going to transpire when Messiah is going to be crucified, okay, killed. Now, the decree to rebuild the walls is not the Cyrus decree. That's from Nehemiah 2.1. Look, it says, in the month of Nisan. I mean, they're giving you months. They're giving you days. He can't make it any more exact. Is this important? Listen to me. I think everything's important. Why would it be in there? And if I'm going to teach, i got to teach. And if I'm just going to tell you, hallelujah, you're saved, go have food, you don't, what do you need me for? In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of the king, we know from, from, we have historical books when it is. It happened that I took the wine and brought to him. Who took the wine? Nehemiah, he was a wine bearer. Prior to then, I never appeared. And he says, why are you so sad? He loved Nehemiah. He said, because the city's rebuilt in Jerusalem, but the wall is down. Then they go back and rebuild the wall in 52 days. Okay? So this is the decree to rebuild the walls that you saw in Daniel 9, 24 through 26. The date of this, look at this, is March 5th, 444. If you count forward 173,830 days from that decree, according to the prophecy in Daniel, this is what you come up with. 33 AD. March, Passover, 33 AD. Why is that phenomenal? Because we know his ministry was three and a half years. We know his ministry was three and a half years. We know he was born in the fall. We know he died at Passover. We have the exact time. Why in the world would we celebrate his birth on December 25th? Especially when we know that celebrates the return of the sun for those who were sun worshipers. Why would you take a holy God, a holy Messiah, a holy holiday, a holy event, and put on it a heathen day of worship? And you say it's okay. What else is okay? What else is okay? Is it okay to look at a little pornography? Is it okay to be a little bit of a pedophile? Rabbi, that's crazy. It's not crazy. If you give the devil an inch, he becomes your ruler. It doesn't make me better than my pastor friends. I love my pastor friends. They work hard. They love the Lord. They love their people. They're great men of God. I honor them and respect them wholeheartedly. But when I come to their church and they kid around, they whisper to me, what do you think about my pagan tree? I, I don't know what to say. I'm like, you know it's pagan, but you keep it up there? I don't say that. I just go, oh my God, that's crazy. Cat's out of the bag. It's my tradition, Rabbi. Yeah, well, my tradition was to totally deny Yeshua, and I gave up that tradition. Listen, I have to be incredibly careful. You have no idea how careful. Let me explain it to you since it's a little crew and who knows who's listening around the world. 
I have like a kind of a prophetic call. And that's why you see me in these last days, prophesying a lot. And, but I have to be very careful not to attack and think that I'm better than anybody. Now, if you think that, you don't know me, lady. No, you don't. You don't. Come, come live with us and you'll see. By the same token, I have to call what's wrong, wrong. So it's a very tough call. I don't want to end up in a cave thinking I'm the only one. I'm not the only one. And there's probably men of God that I know that are far superior to me in character. I wouldn't doubt it. And I'm not saying I have anything right or that I'm walking in this great walk. I'm not even, I don't even think that. I'm always thinking I'm not. I'm always being penitent and, and I, I call myself a jerk eight million times a day. Even when I'm happy, I go, don't get too happy. Don't get stupid. I just said this this morning. The Holy Spirit speaks to me on a regular basis to keep me in control so I don't become a jerk and thinking I'm better than anybody else. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think I'm better than you. No way. But somewhere along the line, you got to stand up for what you know is wrong. And it's always about the message, never about the messenger anyway. I just don't want you as my family to get the wrong idea, thinking, does he think he's better than my... Not even close. Nope, not even close. But I think if this is common knowledge now, then it's exactly what Yeshua... The only thing that got Yeshua literally pissed off was when the religious community was doing man-made religion. He never got mad at the world. He never found a prostitute or a drunk that he couldn't hang out with and forgive. It was the people that should have known better. This is man-made. Now, with that being said, let's move on to happier things. Happier things. If you use Luke 1, 2, 3, it's, it's, you can't argue it. In fact, I'm telling you, even, even A.T. Robinson says something so sensible. He says, look, it says that the sheep were out in the pen at night. What were these, the sadistic shepherds of Samaria? You don't put sheep in a pen in December. They'll die. They're always inside. He says, even that logically tells you it, it couldn't be. It had to be the fall of the spring. And why do you think there was no room at the inn? Why do you think all the hotels are booked? When you go to an event in a city and all the hotels are booked, why? Because it's a big event. It was Sukkot. It was one of the pilgrim festivals. All the Jews were coming to Jerusalem. Guys, you got to use a little logic. You got to stop reading like you're some Greek theologian. This thing was written in Israel by a bunch of Jews. Of course there's no room. It's overrun with pilgrims. Why would it be over on the Pilgrim's December? You can get a hotel anywhere in Jerusalem December 25th. Not kind of a sun god festival. It all, it all makes sense now, right? It's just so logical and so theological and so scriptural and all that stuff. And I'm not here to win a case because I have my own issues. I'm just saying on this issue, it's, it's irrefutable. And it does matter. Everything matters to God. Otherwise, he would have left all this stuff out. And he wants, the enemy wants us to leave it out. It's the enemy who says, that's not important. No, don't worry about it. Come on, how many times have you said, oh, give a little look. Give a little look. Nobody's around. It's just you and the computer. Come on, that's how the enemy talks, man. The enemy's always cajoling, going, ah, come on. You ain't hurting nobody. You know, everybody needs a break. You're a good guy. Look at all the good you do. And then the minute you do it, he goes, ha, you idiot. And he laughs at you. He goofs on you. And he goes, you're so stupid. And that's him talking, not God. God's right there looking to fix you. But that's why God says, don't give him a foothold. He's out to get you. He's out to get you. All right. Leviticus 23, 40, almost home. 
It says, on the first day, you ought to take choice fruits, palm fronds. Why? We're thanking God because he says, when you get in the land, you're going to have water from cisterns. You didn't dig. <laughs> you're going to have fruit from plant. You didn't plant no trees. You know what I'm saying? Just like you went to Kroger and had some bread. You didn't thrash the wheat. It's a pretty good deal. Yeah. I mean, people still complain about prices. I don't know, man. You know, they still, every time a stamp goes up two cents, they freak out. I'm like, here, here's 35 cents. Bring this letter to California tomorrow for me. <laughs> On the first day, you're to take choice fruit, palm fronds, thick branches, river, will, wave them before the Lord. Thank you, God. And it says celebrate. What did I tell you Sukkot's all about? I just threw that in because God asked me to. Just if you want to flush that down the toilet and put up a tree, knock yourself out, you're not going to lose your salvation. I'm not here to hurt your feelings, okay? You can throw that out. Just remove that. This, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just, it, God said throw it in. I threw it in. That's that. You know what I'm saying? This is the part God wants you to see. Celebrate. It's all about a celebration. The word is samach. That's why we say, what do we say on the holy days? Chag Sameach, Chag Sameach. Some of you say it. <laughs> uh, it was like uh, when I went to Africa for the first time, I chose to live in the mud huts and chose to eat whatever they ate and everything else. And they, we got very close. And that's how Kenya was, was developed and the synagogue there was developed in the orphanage. We just got very close and we fell in love with each other. And they called me Mzungu Mafrika, which is the highest compliment you can give to a Caucasian in Africa. Um, by the way, some of you African Americans desperately need to go to Africa. You need to see what your heritage is like. It's very different. It really is. Um... They called me Mzungu Mafrika, which means white African. It's the highest compliment you can give a white man. And so we went into this village, and I said, Mugu you know me, I'm always goofing around. Mugungu Mafrika! And people started to run because that means witch doctor. And, you know, there were a lot of heathens who practiced witchcraft. And they saw me come in with this entourage of Africans, and they thought, oh, God, this white man's going to curse us for some reason. <laughs> so make sure your Hebrew is good. Chag <laughs> Sameach. <laughs> Sameach. The word is beautiful. It's exaltation. It's rejoicing. It's, it's merriment. It's gladness. It's joy. By the way, um, can I get the praise and worship team to, to, to come up and prepare, please? I'm sorry. I'm always late with that. Forgive me. I'm trying to be better. Um, Look at these words. I mean, this is what God is saying at the end of the Sukkot directive, if you will. He's saying, look, man, it's exaltation. It's rejoicing. It's merriment. I tell my kids, I mean, we really get into it. We're going to party today. We're going to have a good time. We're going to try to have a good time all week long. I mean, this is what we're going to do because this is what God wants us to do, and I, I want to do it anyway. So it's all about joy, right? Why? Um, I'm just going to give you three quickies, okay? Look at Isaiah 60. One through four. Let me read a little bit to you. This is, this is part of the why for me. I think it should be part of the why for the believing community. But I don't want to badger the witness. You know, if it is, it is. If it isn't, it isn't. Doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong. Doesn't mean you're right and I'm wrong. But I think this is very important. For a messianic synagogue and a messianic rabbi, it's incredibly important. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stand on this. Arise and shine, Jerusalem, for your light has come. This is, this is prophetic. This, is, this section I'm reading to you is a prophetic picture that Isaiah spoke to the children of Israel about Israel's future glory. It talks about them dwelling in safety, which, you know, is a far cry, obviously, and happily. Now listen, for me, a Jew, you know, who believes in the king of the Jews, this is just floors me. Um, Arise and shine, Jerusalem, for your light has come. This is yet prophetic. This isn't talking about his first time. The glory of Adonai has risen over you. For although darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the peoples, on you Adonai will rise. Over you will be seen his glory. Now, we don't see that yet, so obviously it's not his first coming. That was when they talked about a virgin will be born. You're talking about Isaiah 7, 14, not this part of the prophetic book. Nations will go towards your light. Well, that hasn't happened. If anything, they're looking to put out the light. But there is a time in the future that God promises. And it says Yeshua is being detained in heaven 
until all that the prophets prophesy come to pass. That's why it even speaks in Daniel, no more prophecy, remember? Once he comes. There's no more prophecy, it's over. But he's detained according to Acts 3, 19 through 21. He's detained because all the prophecy has to come to fruition. And that's why I tell you, instead of speaking to some of these prophets or so-called prophets today, speak to the prophets of old and find out what is yet to come to pass and hold on to it and speak it. When, we, when I'm reading this right now, I am prophesying. Yes, I am. Nations will go towards your light and kings towards your shining splendor. Raise your eyes and look around. They are all assembling and coming to you. This didn't happen in the first century. It, it's going to happen. Guys, and I think it's in your time. Your sons are coming from far off. I mean, this is a far cry from the Holocaust. Your daughters being carried on their nurses' hips. Let's continue. In the past, you were abandoned and hated so that no one would even pass through you, which is true. It was a detestable land. Detestable. But now I will make you the pride of the ages, a joy for many generations. You will drink the milk of nations. You will nurse at royal breasts. Figurative. He's saying that all wealth will stream into you. Why do you think it says the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous? People claim that, you know, some of these prosperity gurus, they're taken out of context, talking about the wealth of the nations will stream into Israel in the kingdom, period. Why? The king of the Jews, their king is going to be living in Jerusalem, sitting on his throne in the temple. Of course wealth is going to stream in. <laughs> this is beautiful. Guys, I, I, I don't, I'm sorry that I'm taking up too much time, but um, this is just beautiful. I could, I could sit here all day long and talk to you about this. I could sit all night, all day, all tomorrow. I could sit for the next eight days and nonstop talk about this. I, Adonai, am your savior, your redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. For bronze, that's judgment, I'll give you gold, deity. For iron, that's, that's a judgment that doesn't bend, I'll bring you silver, righteousness. Bronze in place of wood, even wood. Iron in place of stones. I will make shalom your governor. Peace will govern you. Imagine. Guys, I've been to Israel so many times. The, the people have no peace. Not because they don't know Messiah, just because, because their kids could be blown up any day at a coffee shop. You never worry about that. When your kid says, I'm going to Starbucks, you don't say, here, put on your bulletproof vest. Now listen to this. Violence will no longer be heard in your land. The violence, that word in Hebrew is Hamas. Hamas. Hamas will no longer be heard in your land. Desolation or destruction within your borders. Instead, you will call your walls Yeshua. Salvation. Your gates, Halal. Praise. No more will the sun be your light by day. No, no. Nor the moon. At, no, no, no. You have something better than sunlight and moonlight. Instead, Adonai will be your light forever. And your God, your glory. No longer will your sun go down. Your moon will no longer wane. For Adonai will be your light forever. He's talking about after the millennial reign. There's no, nothing new under the sun. He's talking about revelation. It's already been done. I could show you in the Old Testament. I could show you salvation. Redemption, the millennial reign, and the new heavens and the new earth without even popping into Matthew. I don't know, it'll be your light forever, your God, your glory. No longer will your sun go down. I don't know, it'll be your light forever. Your days of mourning will end. Sounds like, sounds like Revelation 22, no more tears. All your people will be tzaddikim, righteous. Guys, we're righteous, not because we're righteous. You know, that menorah outside is very significant. you got a menorah coming in on the gates. We pray about these things. We plan these things. When you come into the gates, you're in the outer courtyard. This is not the outer courtyard. The minute you come on this property, you're in a holy place. And many of you feel it. Just walk around the land. You'll feel the presence of God. The minute you walk into that place, that's the holy place, not the outer courtyard. You see the purple with the silver menorah? The purple is, is the king of the Jews who've imputed righteousness onto his people doesn't the bible say we're clothed in the righteousness of messiah then what that tells you is before you come in here i want you to look at that menorah and i want you to see that it was god's grace that imputed righteousness 
when you walk through these doors, you've got to worship him based on that truth. And then you see his deity, the gold menorah, the seven spirits that you see in Revelation 4. All your people will be tzaddikim. They will inherit the land forever. <laughs> they will be the branch I planted, my handiwork in which I take pride. You, you imagine reading this, that it's yet to come, this has to be fulfilled before Yeshua comes, and there's very well-intentioned believers, beautiful believers, that say Israel's replaced. I mean, they, they're directly speaking against the word of God. It's insanity. Where do you get that from? Well, somebody told me. The smallest will grow to a thousand. Starts to spiral up. The weakest will become a mighty nation. I, Adonai, when the right time, and I always tell you timing, promises intersect with timing, and it's called destiny. I'm telling you that his promise has been his timing is coming in your time. When the right time comes, I will quickly bring it about. What that means is, when the time is right at that exact, I will not wait another second. Twinkling of an eye, bam! The eastern sky opens, bam! When it happens, it's bam! You don't even have time to, you don't have time to wink. You don't have time to blink. You better be ready. So, why should we celebrate Sukkot? Because Israel is going to be restored. The love, the love of his life. Coming back for his wife. Number two, I'm not leaving you out of this. No way, I love you too much. Revelation 19, 1 through 7 and 21 through 2. Look at how heaven is rejoicing when the king comes. Look at how heaven is rejoicing. And when you see me go, Rabbi, you really push us and you really push us and you really push us. God wants me to push you. God wants me to push you. It says, after these things... After the seals, I heard what sounded like the roar of a huge crowd in heaven. Who are they? Shouting, hallelujah. Well, the crowd is not the angelic host. There's going to be tribulation saints. That Steppenwolf magic carpet ride isn't exactly the way the Bible speaks about. Sorry. I'm not worried. I want to see the power manifest, the grace of God I read about those disciples. I read about Stephen, and I'm blown away. I hope the grace falls on me like that. The glory, the victory, the power of our God. For his judgments are true and just. He's saying don't. Because he's coming back as the judge. Firing his eyes, sword in his mouth. And he's saying don't make any mistake. It's true and just. You know what's so amazing about his ministry for three and a half years? It's so significant. That's why people say, well, it's three years. No. Rabbi, what's the big deal? It's a huge deal. It's 42 months. The second half of the tribulation is 42 months. 3,000 priests died. Remember? Mount Sinai. Because they were worshiping a calf. 3,000 were saved. On Mount Zion. God's a good God. 42 months he preached. 42 months he preached to Israel. 42 months they'll be in the great tribulation. The time of Jacob's troubles. You got it? Everything is perfect. He has judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with her whoring. Babylon, the system. He has taken vengeance on her and who has the blood of his servants on her hands. And a second time they said, hallelujah. Her smoke goes up forever and ever. They're happy. The 24 elders and the four living beings fell down and worshiped God. They start yelling. They, 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 they hear the hallelujah from the crowd. They see the smoke of the world system and the great whore Babylon go up. The 24 elders, they freak out. They drop. The four living creatures, they drop and they start yelling, Amen! The truth has become true. Everything you spoke this saying is coming to pass. All your promises are yea and amen. And they say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. A voice went out from the throne saying, praise our God, all you his servants. You who fear him, you who respect him. Small and great. Doesn't matter, the prince or the pauper, man, praise him, he's coming back. Then I heard what sounded like the roar of a huge crowd, like the sound of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder, saying, hallelujah. I mean, look what's going on here, man. Heaven is rejoicing. Hallelujah, Adonai, God of heaven's armies, Adonai Tzivaot, the Lord of hosts, has begun his reign. That's what, that's what we should be praying for. Why do you think they're going nuts? We should be praying the kingdom come. We, we haven't prayed it. 
the body stopped praying it after the first century. It just stopped praying it. Now things are getting tough, so guess what they're praying? Come back, Yeshua. Even if it's out of desperation, I like it. Wait, listen, if the tribulation saints, if the 24 elders, if the angelic host, if the four living creatures are excited about it, where do you think we should be? I, I know I could be annoying. I know. I annoy myself. But maybe you'll be so annoyed that you'll get past me and just go into some psycho, crazy, flagrant praise. Maybe you'll wake up in the morning, instead of grabbing coffee and say, ah, you'll just say, thank you, God, for another day to praise you. Let us rejoice and be glad. There it is. You say, why, why am I celebrating Sukkot? Um, let us give him the glory. For the next time has come for the, we the wedding feast. Not only is he returning to rule, but hey, who doesn't like a wedding? Come on. Who, me and my wife, I I'll be honest with you. One time, we just crashed a wedding. We did it one time. It was in Madison, Georgia. It was really dumb. And I told you it was dumb. Because I tried to, she's never done it. Me and my friends just do it all the time before I was saved. I said, you got to go to a big wedding. This was like just a few people. I go, they're going to know we don't belong. <laughs> so she, she goes, it was, it was like a, a romantic interlude. So I was letting her have her way. You know what I mean? So she goes, let's try it. So I go, it's not going to work. Come on. I said, it's not going to work. So we go in there, very nice way, suit. And she says, hey, let, let's dance. I go, oh, you want to you dance? Okay. So I said, enjoy it because we're not going to get this dance finished before the few people come over. They go, what are you doing? I go, it, it was, it was. <laughs> I said, tell them. Tell them what you're doing. So I said, I'm sorry. We'll leave. And as we're leaving, the bride says, the bride's by the door. She says to Brenda, she goes, I don't recognize you. And Brenda goes, you look lovely. She goes, thank you so much. I said, let's grab her by the arm and yank her out. Everybody likes a wedding. It's festive. You know, today, sadly enough, we could sit there at a beautiful wedding when, when, you know, people don't have a lot of faith in weddings anymore. I do very few weddings. I preside over, I've presided over 12 in years and years, okay, since I'm in ministry. I turn down a ton, not because I think I'm special, because if I think they're really not right where they should be I just won't touch it I know it's not my fault but I'm supposed to be officiating giving my blessing how could I give my blessing so I'm very particular very well, I get calls like can you do a Jewish wedding yeah but not for you <laughs> so so everybody loves a wedding but today it's kind of weird because you'll see people at a wedding which will be so joyous and they'll be like I don't like the chicken I'm like it li when me and Bernadette got married we cut the list to a hundred people of the hundred twenty how many were in the wedding party 18. 18 were in the wedding party. My closest friends and family, I wanted people there who were totally excited to be there. Not anybody would go, oh, I had to fly to get here. Golly, they don't have, they have a buffet. I didn't want anybody, any complaints, it was out. And because I was paying for it, I got to make the call. Amen. Weddings are festive. Weddings in Judaism last seven days. Wine's flowing. Remember Cana? Hey, Miriam, talk to your son. There's no more wine. It's, it's a... It's a Shonda, it's a shame. They were festive. They went on for seven days. All the weddings I've been to are so fantastic. We have such a good time. What do you think the wedding that's coming? <laughs> what do you think? What do you think that's gonna be like? That's why they're so excited. The wedding of the Lamb and his bride has prepared herself. That's what you're doing. You're preparing yourself right now for the wedding. Sukkot, you should be getting ready, making a rehearsal. Can you imagine being a sourpuss when Yeshua comes to marry you? Next, I saw an angel coming down from heaven who had the key to the abyss. <gasps> and a great chain in his hand. It's like Haman, the very gallows he built hung him. The very chain that Satan's been using to restrain God's children is going to hang him. Yeah. 
He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, the adversary, and chains him up for a thousand years. Now, quick side note, he's going to be chained up. So you can't do a Flip Wilson anymore. When you mess up, you're going to have to fess up. You can't say, the devil made me do it. We throw that around a little too much. Last but not least, in Revelation 22.20, Yeshua says, it's, it's for reals. It's for reals. He says, the one who is testifying to these things, and Yeshua is the one who's testifying. He's bearing witness. He's giving you a report, a record of what's to come. He said, yes, I am coming soon. Now, a thousand years is like a day. And if you do a little calculation, if you live to be 76 years old, you're here for about an hour and a half on the eternal scale. So a thousand years is like a day until Yeshua, it's, it's nothing. And they say, amen, come Lord Yeshua. What I'm saying is, even though this might be crazy, and as time goes on, it's more crazy to believe it. I, I, your rabbi, choose to absolutely, positively believe it. I make that choice by faith. Even if I show you every detail in Luke 1, 2, and 3, if I show you every date, if I show you all the prophecy that has come to pass, there's about 300 prophecies, 33 that still have not. So much that I can show you still my walk is a faith walk. It's still a faith. When it all comes down, I have to walk this thing out by faith. I choose to believe from the signs and just what God is sharing with me that it's going to come soon. I choose to believe that. And I choose to be very excited about that. Not because all life is falling apart. Right now, God has to be, we're in a season of blessing. That could change at any time. But it doesn't matter. I don't care if we're being incredibly blessed or not so blessed. I want to see the king. So like I told you, after that Sukkot, after the millennium, the good news is the villain gets his. The hero gets the girl. And they live happily ever. Guys, if you, if you got to take off, we're just going to worship for a while. Um, by all means, if you've, if you've got to go back or you've got somewhere to go, or you've got, please, don't, don't feel any kind of obligation. I'm glad for you that are here. For those listening in Kenya, in India, in Israel, in definitely Australia, Chag uh, Sameach, really. Um, I hope you're blessed. And uh, for anybody else that might be listening around the world, uh, drop us an email. Let us know how, uh, how our ministry is serving you. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I just uh, pray for you guys. Um, a blessing over you this season. I pray that even some of you that have been going through tough times, and I don't want to be insensitive. I never will be. I told Bernadette I would never be insensitive. I just hope you experience the joy of the Lord today and this week. We're going to be out at the um, Lake Julie Ray. I mean, Juliet. <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a blessing yesterday for me. I'll tell you why. Um, there's a scene for me in the Bible that's, that's very touching to me. For all kinds of reasons. And I hate to see people in captivity, and I've done my fair share of prison ministry. And I've seen people in captivity out of prison, incarcerated by life, and it hurts me. I act kind of tough, but I'm just a little pushover, just a pushover, big, big, fat crybaby, cry all the time. Yesterday when I saw the kids dancing, and I saw the lights and the music, and there was just a small crowd, I heard God say to me, Moses, your people are free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And his presence is fullness of joy. So I pray the Spirit of the Lord just infuse you over these next eight days. 
come out. There's coffee early at 7 o'clock. There's teaching in the morning. There's some be teaching at night. There'll be a movie night. We've got schedules. Don't feel obligated, but it's kind of a, a nice setting. Come out as you feel like you, you would like to and enjoy the Lord with us. Okay? I hope you, uh, I hope you get a rich, rich indwelling over these next eight days. I'm, I'm banking on it. So again, Chag Sameach. We'll uh, praise the King and um, for a little bit, and then I'll, I'll bless you, okay?
kingship, Lord. Oh, Shema, oh, Shema, oh, Shema, oh, Adonai Echad. Oh, Shema, oh, Shema, oh, Shema. Great. I was just thinking, you know, there was so many times over the years that I was so unhappy. Just things were so tough, and there was a lot of going on, and it wasn't always peaceful. It was a lot to deal with, a lot of stuff, overwhelming, too much for. And then you guys stepped up and came through and really took a load off our shoulders. Like, I feel like, you know, a Jethro just came in and just gave us all these angels. And they all came forward like about three years ago. It was like, and they're still coming forward, and you just bless us, man. You help us out a lot, and you, you, you give me the time that I need to spend with God, you know? I really, um, one day you'll come into my office, and you'll see you'll be so unimpressed. You'll see my six books in my library. <laughs> and you'll be like, this rabbi's not that smart at all. Look at his library. And so I, I just don't do it like that. I try to just spend time with the Lord and, and hear Him and feel Him and sense Him. And then if I could feel it and I could see it, then I could give it. But whenever I try to get it from a, it just doesn't translate for me. And you know what's really funny? Um, I find this so funny. Saturday, I always feel God's presence. Like a lot of times I don't even know who's here. Like Linda, my neighbor, I met, look at her and when I'm preaching, she might say, oh, that was, I was, and I don't even know she's there. And some of you say, you were looking right at me, and I felt like you were talking to me. I don't even know you're here. It's weird, because I'm in my own little, you know, God, Greg world, when that happens. But Saturday, I didn't feel the Lord at all. Very strange. It was like scary. And about halfway, I looked at Bernadette, and she knew what I was saying. I was going to tell you guys, I'm just going to stop. I don't feel the Lord, and I can't do this. And then when I left, the minute I got in the car, I go, I've never felt like that. And the message was all about, even when you don't feel God, He's there. And I got email after email from people who said, that was exactly, you don't know how bad I needed it. Isn't that weird that I'm giving a message on believing God's there even when you don't feel Him, and I don't feel Him the whole time, which is, don't you think that's weird? Yeah. See, I tell you all the time, I get the teaching before I give the teaching. And I'm being taught with you. I'm, I'm hearing sometimes God say something through me to me that he didn't say all week. And I go, wow. And that's why I get so nuts because I'm learning just as you are. Isn't that weird? Yeah, it's kind of cool. It's so cool. And that's what keeps me good and humble. And that's what keeps me loving God. And I love you. I really do. And I hope, I hope uh, things keep going well for us here. And when I say well, I don't mean easy or nice or no problems. I just mean that, that God stays present here. I just, you know what I mean? I mean, I just, because the day that, that he decides to leave, I'll have to leave. I can't stay where he's not. I just can't. You know, I'm like an addict. I'm like a junkie. You know, I need a fix all the time of God's presence. And if it's not there, I just, it won't work for me. So pray for me too, will you? Pray for me.
just, you know, keep me in your prayers and just pray that, that I stay close to God and I don't become a jerk. Um, you guys are really special. I just feel so many times that I don't deserve you. I just feel like you're so special. And, and as much as some, I, I know I could feel sometimes you're like in, a little impressed with my walk, but I'm just as impressed with yours, if not more. I, you know, I feel like I'm called to do this. You kind of volunteer to do this, you know? And so it's more impressive to me. You're more impressive to me. And so whenever I think of any of you, I know some of you think, well, he hasn't talked to me, he hasn't. I think about you all the time. You know, this is like my baby. And I'll do anything to protect it. And um, so just know that, and if I don't, if I don't, give me an opportunity, like just text me and say, hey, man, you haven't said anything to me in like a while. And then I'll text you back and say, well, you haven't said anything to me in a while. <laughs> you don't ever see those from me, right? I mean, some of you don't say anything to me and I don't, I know we're all busy. We're all running and gunning. It's a busy world. It's a crazy world. Everybody wants things yesterday and there's so much to do and so little time, but Today, if you don't have to, relax. Rest your head on the pillow. And don't rest it to have thoughts. Just relax. And just think about one thing, how, how crazy God is about you. Even if husband or wife left or boss fired or even when you say these crazy things about yourself, which I do all the time, just if you can focus on anything today, just hear God say, I'm so crazy about you. And you, you don't have to do nothing for me. I legitimately am crazy about you. I'm telling you he is. With all the mistakes and all the crazy things you've done and I've done, trust me, if there's anything I believe, it's that he's crazy about you. You hear? So, uh, I'm going to let you depart the premises. Uh, if you'll grab a hand of somebody close to you if you'd like, that will bring us close together. It uh, poured last night while we were praising and worshiping, and God promised me it would pour. And he promised me it would rain today, and then we're going to run into some sunshine. It's just going to be very beautiful for us the rest of the week at the campsite. Um, so we'll have no excuse not to be there. <laughs> Can't take the sun. <laughs> yeah, that, that won't work. Oh, man. God has been really good to us over this past year here. Really, he's been good to us, right? It's incredibly good. I mean, just good. He's really blessed us with his uh, love and his grace. Such a merciful, wonderful God. And, and in a few days, we'll be back here Saturday morning for Shabbat. It's going to be wonderful. And then, boom, another eight-day celebration, which this is like an appetizer. This is, was a little bit more informative. That one's just going to be, you know. <laughs> celebrate good times. Come on. Let's celebrate. It's going to be more like that on that eighth day. So, so good. Um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance. It's so important that you know what that means. It's not just his face, but his countenance is the expression of his face, and I'm telling you, it's one of a smile. May the Lord lift up that smile upon you, and through seeing his smile over you, may you have peace. In the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Adonai v'yishmarecha Yo e anoi ponove lecha vihunecha Yisa anoi ponove lecha Vyasem lecha Shalom Shag Shmeach